Your Dog's Friend is a nonprofit 501c3 whose mission is to help keep dogs out of shelters by educating and supporting their humans. We promote positive method of training and behavior modification through stress-free methods. As part of that mission, we offer free webinars like the one you're about to watch. Subjects range from dog behavior, stress-free training, and other tools to help you understand your relationship with your dog. If you like the webinar, be sure to give us a thumbs up. Click the notification bell and subscribe to our channel. By subscribing, you'll be notified when future videos are posted. Now enjoy the webinar. Welcome to today's webinar sponsored by your dog's friend. Our topic is control, un control unleashed, a training protocol that helps dogs stay calm and focused. This is our second webinar related to control unleashed, but this one is focused on how the power of choice can help with your dog's challenges. Our speaker, Angie Madden, is the trainer and owner of Dog Speak in Gaithersburg, Maryland, and is certified as both a dog trainer and a Control Unleashed instructor. Angie teaches Control Unleashed classes at your dog's friend's training facility in Rockville, Maryland. She came to dog training after working in aquariums and zoos, a background that gave her a unique perspective on animal behavior. Please put your questions in chat. We will try to get to as many questions as possible. Uh, we may not get to them all and we will probably wait until the end. You may not know that your dog's friend is a nonprofit. Your donations help support these webinars and our other free services. So please consider going to the donations icon at the top right corner of our homepage to donate. We appreciate your support. I know that you will all learn a lot from today's webinar. I will too. It's all yours, Angie. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so welcome to the Power of Choice with Control Unleashed. Um, we are going to be focusing specifically on um, cooperative protocols today. And so I tend to refer to that as um, cooperative care and counter conditioning. Um, but first, just a quick introduction to Control Unleashed. If you are not familiar with this or did not see the first webinar, um, it is a program that was developed by Leslie McDevitt. And it primarily focuses on conversational training. So really highlights communication between you and your dog and that connection. Um, my favorite quote about it is from Ken Ramirez, and he says that it is classical conditioning with an operant base. Um, these concepts are outlined in her third book, um, Control Unleashed, Reactive to Relaxed, specifically the requested approach training and voluntary sharing protocols that we're going to go over today. So these are the uh, things where I'm going to be talking about. Um, cooperative care um, mainly refers to any husbandry behaviors, grooming, um, and counter conditioning protocols is the voluntary sharing and requested approach training. Uh, requested approach training. So changing how your animal feels about something in particular. Um, and both of those utilize start buttons. So what do we mean when we say cooperative? Essentially, it means that the animal is in control of the process. So that is key. Um, why use cooperative care and counter conditioning? Um, it establishes trust. So it's, it's a great tool to continue to build that relationship with your animal. Um, and to, and to help them feel empowered um, and want to be a, a willing participant in um, these essential tasks. <laughs> um, so it does that by giving your animal the ability to say, start, continue, or stop a specific procedure. And your animal has the ability to walk away at any time. I guess at this point, I should I could say dog since we're specifically focused on dogs here today. 
Um, it makes communication easy because you have um, a very clear structure that your dog recognizes and able is able to predict and know exactly what's going to happen next because of those clear protocols. And it gives a lot of information to the dog. We utilize um, stations. Context cues are things in the environment that let um, the dog know either what is about to happen or um, what behaviors are appropriate for that particular scenario. All right, a quick note on management. So a lot of the videos that you're going um, to see in my presentation do not involve um, safety equipment because um, there, there was, they were either animals that didn't really need these protocols and I was just um, practicing with them or there wasn't a safety concern for that particular one. Um, but we always like to highlight that if there have been aggression issues, um, that you be sure that you have the appropriate equipment so that it's safe um, for the dog, for any other dogs participating, for the people participating. Um, and also we wanna highlight that the dog is comfortable. So some of the things to help keep your dog comfortable are being sure that you have the appropriate amount of distance. Maybe you can incorporate some visual barriers, um, protected contact is that safety issue. Um, your dog needs to be sub threshold for these protocols to be successful, for your dog to be comfortable. Um, obviously, some of the safety equipment can be leashes, muzzles, gates, X pens, um, remote feeders. If it's one trainer trying to work with two different um, animals and one of them is behind um, a barrier. So all of those fantastic tools at our disposal. All right. So let's jump right into start buttons. Um, this was a new concept for me when I first started learning about Control Unleash, and it's one of my favorites. I feel like it opens so many doorways. Um, once you start using start buttons, you realize how many different ways you can incorporate this into your training um, with your dogs. So what is a start button? It is a behavior that the animal performs to cue a specific procedure. What is the difference between a cued behavior and a start button behavior? So with a cued behavior, it is the trainer telling the animal to perform a specific behavior. So for example, saying sit. The animal only receives a reward if the animal responds by performing the behavior that was requested. So if the animal sits, they get a treat. Um, the trainer starts and ends the training session. So that's um, standard training. When we start to utilize start buttons, it sort of turns it around. So the animal is the one to tell the trainer to perform a specific procedure. If the animal does not offer their start button, um, so within the context, let's say I'm trying to do a nail trim and my dog does not perform the behavior that means trim my nails, they may still receive a treat because one of the things that we do is make it equally rewarding to say no versus yes. <laughs> <laughs> which I know is counterintuitive, but we will get there. Um, and then also the animal chooses whether or not to participate. And even if they start, they are free to leave at any time. So again, they have complete control over the procedure. All right, there are two different types of start buttons. The first is a one and done. And so this refers to um, a behavior that does not have any length to it. So it's an immediate, something like lowering of the head um pressing a button it's a behavior that causes a specific event or chain of events to occur and it tends to be on or an organically grown start button and what we mean by this is it's not a formally trained behavior it's something that the animal um, offers and we start to incorporate that um, into a specific procedure a duration behavior is one that is performed continuously over a length of time as long as the dog is comfortable with the procedure they continue to do the behavior if they stop doing the procedure they are saying to stop the procedure this one does tend to be formally trained um, the dog can stop the procedure 
or the trainer can end the behavior by marking and feeding or feeding out of place. Marking and feeding or feeding out of place. Okay. I feel like I'm whipping through this. <laughs> I hope everybody's keeping up. Be sure to type in your questions if you have any. Okay. So here is the big question, the philosophical question. Does the dog really understand? A dog that offers his paw, is he really saying, trim my nails? Or is he just performing a conditioned behavior? I don't know that we can ever truly answer that question. I don't know, maybe there's some science lab or something out there that could, but for practical purposes, for our purposes, what's really important is that your dog is comfortable and the procedure is successful. Um, and so as long as they are making those choices, those choices are clear to them, there isn't any pressure for them to say yes, we're sure that they're comfortable, then I, then I think that's really all that we need to know. All right, how do we address this? How do we be sure that the dog is comfortable and there is no subtle pressure to say yes if they are uncomfortable? One of the ways is to not use your highest value treats. Um, so there isn't this high drive to say yes, because, oh, I only get peanut butter when we do my nails. Um, I talked about making um, the yes and the no um, equally rewardable. We can make starting and stopping equally rewardable. Um, we reward out of position. So if the dog is performing a chin rest, for example, I'm not going to feed the dog while they're doing their chin rest. I'm going to um, feed the dog away from that spot. So the dog has to stop doing the behavior to eat. And then it is up to them whether they go back to doing the behavior. And that's how they tell us, yes, you can do it again. Um, or no, let's take a break. All right, so let's get to it. Um, this is my first example of um, a start button, and you're going to see a couple different um, clips of me going through this procedure with my dog, Piper. Um, I wanted to experiment with the one and done start button because I have always utilized chin rest start buttons, so the duration behavior that was formally trained. And I didn't have any one and done start button. So that's what I'm attempting to do here. Um, Piper did have a formal chin rest that we had worked a lot on. It tends to be her go-to to request something. So because of that, there's that lowering of the head involved. And so I was capturing the lowering of the head to see if that could be the start button. So she lowers her head and that um, is the behavior. So, You'll see as we go through there, because the chin rest is so established, she eventually starts doing her chin rest. And once she starts doing that, then I shift over to having um, the chin rest, so a duration start button um, be the behavior. And as you watch this video, you're gonna, I wrote out text that sort of describes what's happening in those steps. But I just wanted to give you that heads up um, and then when the video is playing, I will be silent. <laughs> All right, so here you can see um, as we start from the very beginning to what the finished product looks like in establishing a start button specifically for brushing.
Okay. Um, just a couple notes before we go on there. Um, I, I love how she scoots forward to put her chin down. Um, so somebody mentioned no sound. I hope there is sound, but it was very soft because I'm I'm just speaking quietly. I wasn't marking originally. And then when I do start marking, it's very um, softly. Um, so hopefully as we go forward, if there is a video that has sound or you need sound, you can just let me know if that's not coming through. Somebody asked, which is always the question, if it's equally rewarding to say no, why does the dog ever say yes? And I am going to throw it back to the title of this presentation. Something about having that choice, just the power of that choice, um, that they're willing to say yes, because they can have that control. Um, they threw out the example of shots, that they would never have shots if they didn't, <laughs> if there wasn't anything in it for them. Um, you know, there, there's always going to be some. So like it, as a person, if we don't get the shot, then we no, either know what the fallout is or like if we're going overseas and we don't get the shots, then we can't go overseas. So, you know, there's going to be some inherent there. Um, but I think with the dog, you know, with the dogs and other animals, I think there's just something in, inherently empowering and figuring out that they can control the situation. And one of my favorite things is when the is when the dog says no, because I, I just love watching them test this. Well, what happens if I say no? Oh, oh, I still, oh, I still get something? Oh, all right, well, let me say yes again. And it's just really cute. And there'll be a couple videos here where you'll see the, the, um, the dog say no. And then after that, they go back to saying yes. Um, specific question about this. Do you wait for the dog to lower their head? Because I knew that because it's a behavior that she does. And, um, so yes, I was able to capture it. Um, if you wanted to use that motion, um, if you're familiar with the pattern games, I probably would just play up down because that automatically gets them doing that up down motion. And then you can turn that into the start button and, and we'll, um, You'll see that later on when we get to voluntary sharing, there's a video where it says you could use up down as the start button. Okay, so let's go on. All right, so here is an example of an organically grown start button. So again, um, it's something that the dog is offering and then you can turn that into a start button. So unfortunately, the only thing I have on this video is the finished product. <laughs> Um, so I'm just going to talk you through event. So basically when the dogs would go outside, the grass would be wet. And so I would just lay a large towel out on the ground. Um, and when they came back in, they would step on it, pretty much drying their feet off. And I would drop some treats on the towel. Um, and what sort of happened was Obi, so the, the brown dog here, um, who's my boy, the treats would sort of get in the towel. And so he would start to paw at the towel to find the treats. And I was like, ooh, so he's pawing. I can sort of teach him, you know, like train him to actually paw at the towel. So then I started like bunching the towel up and putting the treats in there. And what eventually happened was pawing became a behavior that he started to offer because I was marking and treating for that. And it sort of morphed into him offering his paw all the time, like, oh, here, if I give you my paw, I get a treat, right? Um, and that made it really easy for me to then transfer to cueing it by holding out a towel because he associates that with the pawing behavior. So I would hold up a towel, he would offer his paw, I would wipe his paw, um, and then he would take that paw back and he would offer me a paw and I would wipe it again. I apologize. Apparently my husband's phone is in here and it's buzzing at me. <laughs> Um, so that's the steps that you don't see. What you're going to see in this video is basically the end behavior. And then one other thing that sort of morphed out of it, which I'll talk a little bit more afterwards, but I'll, I'll let you watch it first. Good 
Okay. So in the second half of that video, you noticed that he rolled over onto his side, which, which gave me access to his back paws. Um, I don't remember the exact steps of how that came about, um, but he does tend to roll over a lot to get belly rubs. And so I'm suspecting that maybe just with the handling, it sort of naturally came about that he started rolling over um, to ask for that. And again, I just captured that behavior. I was like, oh, you're rolling over. Now I can do your paws. And then I, you know, would mark and feed for that. So I would, you know, wipe one paw because that was challenging for him. He's a little less comfortable with me handling his back paws than his front. So I would, you know, he would give me access. I would do one paw, mark and treat. And then I would wait and see, does he roll over again to offer? And I would do the other one. So that opened up a lot of doors. <laughs> And so he essentially has two different start buttons at this point. One is offering of the paw and the other one is rolling over on his side. And um, the next examples that you're going to see is me transferring it to other contexts. Um, so we went from using these two start buttons for wiping his paws to using them for nail trims. So if he offers me his front paw, that's saying you may trim a nail on this paw. If he rolls over on his side, that means that I can um, trim a back paw. So um, I'm going to show you what that looks like. All right, so <laughs> that brings us to one more transfer. Um, it was really beautiful that this had come about organically because um, a couple months ago, um, he ended up with an ear infection and he needed ear drops. And we had not gotten that far in cooperative care. I had not prepped him for letting me handle his ears or doing any of that stuff. Um, and so I decided to try um, utilizing the established start buttons that we had um, to work with doing the eardrops. And I did, I'm going to note that I did use a high value reward because I didn't have time to go through this process of, oh, you do this and we do this. And I, you know, so basically I wanted it to be worth his while to at least participate. If he could still say no, and he still got the high value reward, but there was some association of, Ooh, when we do this procedure, there's, you know, there's this good stuff that happens. Um, because I just didn't have the luxury of time. Um, if it wasn't for that, I would not have been using the canned yummy food. <laughs> I would have just been using as normal kibble, which is what I tend to use for the other things. Um, but that being said, this is what it looks like.
on this side. I don't think we need to put it. Um, I forgot to mention, so in addition to using the start button, I um, stole Dr. Lin Lin Cow's excellent idea of incorporating um, the one, two, three pattern into cooperative care. Um, I know the audio was soft, but if you could hear it, hopefully you heard me counting. Um, I was doing one, two, three, and in the one, two, three pattern game, three means treat. So basically when I said three, he knew that we were done and it was time to get the treat. And I used each um, count to represent something in the procedure. So one meant that I was lifting up his ear. Two meant that I was applying the drops or if I was cleaning the, with the Q-tip, then I was cleaning with the Q-tip and three meant we were done and it's time to get up and get your um, food reward. And um, I have really found that there are all sorts of different ways that we can utilize the benefits of the one, two, three pattern in other contexts. And it's become sort of my favorite way to build in anticipation, predictability, um, and potentially a bit of duration if necessary. So let's see very quickly. Did I have any specific questions on this one? Um, yes, I did want to mention that. So bef I think we're shifting off of cooperative care here. Let me just double check because I want to be sure to answer that question. Yes. So because we're shifting away from cooperative care, I'm going to go ahead and answer this question. Somebody noted that their problem is they can't even get their dog to come over to them um, when they see the brush insert anything here. It could be when they see the brush, when they see the nail trimmers, when they see the harness. <laughs> um, so the key is you have to start somewhere that they're going to be successful. So you would actually start without the brush. <laughs> and I know that's true. <laughs> so um, I did forget to mention with Piper, you might have noticed that steps one through three were all in one session. Brushing is not aversive for her. Um, we had just never formalized brushing. And I wanted to um, utilize the start button just to give her again, sort of more um, options, more choice, and also just to play around with start buttons. Um, because the more that they understand that concept, the more that you can utilize it in other contexts. So um, I was able to do that because the brush didn't have meaning to her that at least not a negative meaning. So in any of those other scenarios where they do have a negative, then probably what I would start off with is establishing a start button to mean handling. So maybe the start button might mean that I touch if we're working on brushing. If we're doing nail trimming, then I would start with the start button, meaning that maybe I'm handling their paws. And then you could shift over to um, an object that doesn't have meaning. So with the brush, maybe just something that you can run along, but it isn't actually the brush that they have that association with. Um, with nail trims, it could be something that you either touch their nail with, or maybe it could be something else that sort of moves. So you can practice just sort of that movement. And so it's always going to be, and this is pretty much true with any of the control and leash concepts, you always start where your dog can be successful because that helps you build that foundation. So you have to have a starting point and finding out what that starting point is. And from there, you can build on it. So once we've got that, and then we can slowly start to take those steps up the ladder um, to get from here to here, because sometimes it's up here that we're trying to get to. Um, so hopefully that is helpful. Um, but yes, moving on. Okay. Requested approach training, AKA RAT. <laughs> um, this is a one of the protocols that is specifically um, written out that was developed by Leslie McDevitt and um, is in the third book, Reactive to Relaxed. And this is a counter conditioning protocol for um, dogs that are uncomfortable with something, um, or basically anything which um, is either going to approach or they may be approaching, it gives them control over movement. So uh, my official definition here is protocol in which the animal tells the trainer it is okay to approach someone, something, or to be approached. Um, but I, I have found that it, it 
can actually be utilized in even more contexts, or at least a, a wider framework than just approaching. It basically gives the dog control over movement, and that helps them to um, feel more comfortable about something specific, whatever it is that we are working with. So, um, oh, actually, before I go on there, sorry, jumping back, because I did see this. Um, somebody mentioned having specific places to also use those as context cues for what you're doing cooperatively. Um, yes, <laughs> I'm going to come back to that. But yes, remind me on that cooperative care. I definitely want to do that. Okay. How to rat. So you can use a one and done or a duration. The advantages of using a duration is that it's much easier to see if the animal is saying yes, or if they've maybe, so the, the, the problem with the one and done is once the animal says yes, there's no way for them to say no other than getting up and leaving. Um, and we would not like them to get to a point that they're so uncomfortable <laughs> that they get up and leave. Um, we want to be able to, to see and recognize those, those smaller no's. Um, the I'm starting to get uncomfortable or Ooh, I maybe need a break. Um, so having a duration button makes it so much clearer when the animal is saying, yes, keep going versus uh, no, let's stop. So um, uh, just to throw that out there and keep that in mind. So in terms of movement, there are um, two different options, obviously. So the animal, if the animal is the one moving, then their start button tells the trainer to take the animal somewhere. So maybe one step towards something, or maybe you're going over to a station and then retreating from the station. Um, and then it's the, then it can be the reverse. So the animal is stationary, not moving. Um, and there is something else that is approaching them. And so typically it's whatever is approaching comes to a specific station and then turns and moves away. Um, in any of the protocols in Control Unleashed that involved an approach, they are always paired with retreat. So we are always relieving that pressure. If you're getting closer to something that you're not quite comfortable with, it doesn't mean that you're gonna get stuck there. You're gonna be able to move away. If something is coming closer to you and it takes a lot to deal with that, they're not going to stay there. They're going to move away. Um, so it just builds in a, a little bit of, of decompression into the process. Um, the stations help to make it very clear. The dog knows exactly where they're going, or if something else is moving, they know exactly where it's going. Um, and it's really important, as I said, to listen to those little no's. And we'll, we'll hopefully in some of the videos be able to touch on maybe seeing some little no's. Um, in fact, as I was watching the video with the ear, um, if you, if you go back, back and watch this video, um, I think it was one of the last couple reps when he was on the second ear, he laid down and then he sort of halfway came up when, and you'll notice that I did a very short, like I had, I was already in two in the cleaning and it was like a one, two, and we're done <laughs> three. Um, cause he wasn't as fully committed. Um, so there was a bit of a little no there. Okay, so I mentioned Harness. Um, this is Rocket. He is in um, my cooperative care and counter conditioning class at Your Dog's Friend. Um, and uh, they very um, nicely agreed to allow me to share this video with you. So we are using requested approach training with the Harness, um, giving Rocket control over the Harness's movement to help him be a little bit more comfortable. Um, and so you'll see um, what that looks like.
Okay, so um, a couple things. You can see that orange cone is the visual target that tells Rocket exactly where she's going to be um, approaching to. And you'll notice that he threw out a couple no's. Um, I don't think in that scenario he was uncomfortable. I don't think he was worried. I think he was just making sure that he could still control this control the procedure. Um, so, you know, sometimes they just want to be sure that they can say no um, when they've said yes a lot. Like, can I still say no? Oh, yeah. OK, yeah, I can still do that. Um, I also think he was just sort of thinking about it. Um, he does tend to process. <laughs> so he was kind of like, mm, do I want to do this again? Let me think about that. <laughs> and um, there was really nice response in terms of timing of um, waiting to see what Rocket decided, um, paying appropriately, and um, yeah, some really clear um, communication. Okay. So um, that is a good point. Somebody just asked about the chin rest. I didn't include how to do a chin rest in here. Um, I had it in originally and I took it out because I wasn't sure I was going to have enough space. Um, but there are there's information out there on how to teach a chin rest. It is essentially a targeting behavior. So very similar to um, how you would train a nose target, but it's you you know, the body part is the chin instead of the nose. Um, and um, we're adding duration. So we tend to like to use chin rests for duration versus nose targets because it's a lot easier um, for the dog to rest on something than to hold their nose against something for long periods of time. But you could, you could do a um, duration nose target. Um, but there is, uh, I'll try and see if we can put it in the um, chat box, but I do have a video where I go over um, how to teach a chin rest. Um, and we, we, I'm sure there, there's resources out there that can go through that for you. Okay. So these back-to-back -back videos are my, um, my long participants in cooperative um, care and counter conditioning. They've been with me since the first class, um, a couple rotations, so it's always fun. I am going to show you a before and after. So this is um, Hopper, the Corgi, and Hopper has very strong feelings about the canister vacuum. So um, Rebecca was kind enough to share with me uh, what it looked like before we got started. And then this is one of the latest videos that we have of um, Hopper controlling the movement of the vacuum. All right. So pretty typical herding behavior. <laughs> I need to control this thing. All right, and now let's see what sh it looks like when we're doing that. Yes. Yes. I just love her happy tail there. <laughs> okay. Let me see. Okay. So this is my um, last example of rat. And this one is um, a case where the dog in the X pen um, was not getting along well with the other dog in the house. And so um, they were utilizing requested approach training. Um, to help the dog in the X-Pen feel better about the other dog um, approaching. So this is a um, person who did not have a second person to help them. 
So he is utilizing a remote feeder. So that's what's attached to the crate there. And you will see in the video that the um, dog who is controlling the movement, there is a station that's set up for him to rest his chin on. When he does the chin rest, that tells the trainer to bring the other dog over to that blanket station on the ground. Um, and then the person releases the dog from the chin rest by um, feeding them from the remote feeder. So let me go ahead and hit play here and we'll take a look at that. All right, there we go. Okay. Um, in terms of um, the safety equipment in that video, they did do the X pen for safety because there had been aggression incidents in between the dogs. And so um, that was one of the safety measures was having that dog um, in a controlled space so that they could not interact each other. But you could see um, that that dog was choosing to have the other dog move closer, was very comfortable in a relaxed position. Um, so it was a very nice setup for that. But we always want to have that backup safety measure in place um, just to be safe. <laughs> okay. So before we move away from requested approach training, I want to talk about um, making adjustments. So um, what happens, what are some options when the animal says no, or how can we make things easier for them if we find that the setup is too difficult and maybe we're getting a lot of no's um, or the dog isn't saying yes. Um, and so we're, we're getting some indication of discomfort or, um, maybe our setup just isn't appropriate. And so what are some things we can do? Um, so this is a very short clip from my very first ever rat. Um, this is Piper again. Piper is mortally afraid of the bug zapper. And so um, I had my trusty assistant, my daughter there, um, and I set up the cones so that my daughter knew exactly where to go and that Piper could see where she was going to go. So this is rat with multiple stations. Um, this is a more advanced version, um, not to say that you ever have to get here, but um, that's just how I did it. <laughs> um, and there are definitely some things I would do differently now, but basically what was happening was my daughter would move if my, uh, if Piper offered her start button, which was the chin rest on my leg, my daughter would move forward to the next cone. Um, before this video, there was a session where she was just simply holding it and moving forward to the cones, and then she would work her way uh, back down. Or actually, no, I think she went all the way back to the first cone and then would work forward again. Because Piper did really well with that, then I added in a bit of movement. So what you're going to see here is where my daughter is actually moving the bug zapper around, which is what would be happening if we were actually using it. Okay. All right. So what are some adjustments that could be made? 
Um, in this example, when Piper said no, I had her move back one cone. And then I waited to see, was she comfortable enough to offer the chin rest? Um, I could have fed the no. So immediately when she chose not to say yes, I could have given her a treat and then waited to see. Um, I could have not had uh, my daughter approaching so closely. That's one of the things I would change. I would not have that cone that's only like two or two feet away from the mat. Um, probably the next cone was probably as close as I would get um, if I were to set that up today. Um, when Piper said no, I could have had Sam, my daughter, go all the way back to the first cone. So we're totally relieved the pressure and start at the beginning and see if um, as sh she went forward, would she be more comfortable? Um, we could have ended the session there, or we could have taken a short break, again, giving her a little bit of decompression. Um, we could have added a visual barrier. So not for safety, but to help Piper feel more comfortable so that there is something in between her and the scary bug zapper um, that might have helped her to feel more comfortable. Um, and Or the other option was I could have walked, moved Piper away. So instead of my daughter moving away, we, I could have walked Piper away, again, giving her that break. Okay. Voluntary sharing. Um, this is the other protocol described in um, uh, Reactive to Relax. That is the cooperative counter conditioning. Um, and the beauty of cooperative counter conditioning is it essentially puts the dog in charge of their own um, behavior modification. <laughs> um, so this one is designed to help dogs who um, either resource guard or um, have that FOMO fear of missing out. So maybe they don't like to take turns or um, they like to butt in whenever somebody's getting attention. Um, so voluntary sharing is the go-to to help with that. Um, okay. Thing. Oh, yes. So um, this video is uh, one that was recently made. Um, in the video is another Control Unleashed certified instructor, uh, Megan, and her dog, Han, has a tendency to butt in. So if, if Megan is paying attention, um, loving on um, one of the other dogs, he will butt into that procedure. You know, everybody's seen that dog or has that dog who's like, oh, hey, I want in here. And they sort of move the other dog out of the way. Um, there's never been any aggression issues. It hasn't been a problem, um, but it's something that she did want to address in case there ever was a dog in the home who had a problem with that and we want to avoid um, any instances of aggression for sure. And um, we also just wanted to play with voluntary sharing for that specific issue. So um, if somebody did have maybe some aggression issues because one dog is resource guarding the person, how might we do a setup to address that? So because there was no aggression issues, you were not going to see any barriers or anything like that. Um, but those are the types of things that we um, would want to utilize in a situation where there had been aggression between um, the different members. So, um, we started off with the dog that, um, Han is less likely to do that with. So Han gets a little more excited about Megan paying attention to the other, um, border collies, the other, the girls. Um, and so we started with the calmer, more laid back Ridgeback. So again, establishing the procedure, um, making it easy, so that Han got comfortable, knew exactly what was going to happen before we then tried it um, with someone that would be a little more exciting, maybe a little bit more difficult for him not to get involved in. So let's see what that looked like. So you can go ahead and touch this time. Yes. Yes. I kind of want pets. I want that. I know exactly. Fox is like, stop. That's not what I want. Yes. Good. Yes. Oh, very nice. Yes. Yes. 
take my hand away. Yes. I'm just gonna say that last time we didn't take our hand. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Good job. Yes. Yes. Good. We'll do one more and then we'll let Fox retire. <laughs> I know, you're such a silly man. Yes. We'll start exactly where we did the first time with Fox. We'll just run through the exact same sequence. Yes. 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 He's definitely angled toward her a little more, like he really wants mm -hmm. to watch the interaction more. Yes. Correct. Yes. So I can see his eyes are more focused on her. Yes. Than they were with Fox. Yep. He definitely just wants to be aware of what's going on. Good. And Lucy is very grumbly in her personal play. Yes. So if you hear any of that, that's okay. Coming from when I kind of play little hand games with her, she likes to get growly, grumbly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Good. Yes. <laughs> yes. That time I definitely caught it. <laughs> She's like, why am I not getting cookies? Yes. All right. So just a couple of things to highlight on that. You'll notice that we started with the dog that was getting the pets on station at first. Um, so Fox was up on the couch as his station. <laughs> Um, and then we moved to having Fox free roaming. So on the ground also just happened to be a little bit closer to Han. Um, we didn't get to doing that, um, with the other dog, just because we'd been doing it for a period of time and it sort of gave us enough information. Uh, but that would have been the next step. Um, so maybe taking a break cause, um, she was getting a little worked up. And so of course that's always going to be harder, um, a little more intense for Han. So we might have taken a break and then maybe come back and done that or finish there for the day and then come back and do another session later. Um, but hopefully that gives you an idea of um, what those steps might be to work through a dog who has a tendency to, to butt in. <laughs> All right. Um, which, which obviously that scenario is a little bit different than a, a dog who resource guards. But again, it would be a similar setup in that the dog who resource guard would be saying the other dog could have access to the person. That person can interact with that other animal. Um, all right. So now that you've seen it in action, I'm going to go back and um, show you this quick video that essentially walks you through the steps of teaching voluntary sharing. So how the animal would learn um, the procedure.
So essentially the steps are establish the behavior that results in feeding. So this is where I mentioned that it says you could use the up down game. Um, so if you aren't familiar with that pattern game, essentially you just put the treat on the ground. So the dog looks down and when the dog looks up, that cues you to put the next treat down. <laughs> um, Ever has a lowering of the head behavior. So that's what was actually causing the feeding. Um, Ever would lower her head and so she would put food in the bowl. So that was the first step, lower of the head, put food in the bowl, lower of the head, put food in the bowl. Um, step two is transitioning to placing the, the food in the alternate location first. So you saw that she was feeding Ever and then she pulled out a second bowl, still doing step one. And when she transitioned to step two, she put the treat first in the other bowl and then in Ever's bowl. So basically Ever was saying, yes, put food in that other bowl. And that putting food in that other bowl results in food going in Ever's bowl. Um, and then the third step is actually feeding the other animal. Again, this is a case where there was no aggression. Um, there is no resource guarding. So we did not have any um, safety equipment in place, um, no management for that other than can't uh, the cat being in a box station. <laughs> um, so again, if I were doing this with an animal who had a history of resource guarding, I would definitely start with um, some space between them and some safety measures. Those safety measures might be a barrier. It might be having that particular dog on leash and being sure that the other animal was on a station so that we had a set amount of distance. Um, you know, any, there's any number of possibilities of how we would do that, but there would be more management in place than what you see here um, if we were actually working with a resource guarder. Okay. So now you're going to see an example of going through these same steps um, with an animal that had shown um, some resource guarding. There had never um, actually... <laughs> I don't want to take up too much time, but this is a um, client of mine who brought um, two dogs who were um, brought. So it's a boy and a girl. I don't think they're related, but they came together. So um, they were a pair and extremely fearful. Um, I'm not sure if they were street dogs or some history of that. I just can't remember off the top of my head. They were brought into the home and um, shortly after they had gotten there, the lab who was um, the current dog basically had an aggressive issue with the female of the, of the pair. Um, unfortunately, the person was not there. She happened to be up the stairs and happened to be coming down and she heard it, but didn't see what started it. Um, so there had been some history of aggression between them. Um, and so they had remained separated um, since then. So Jin is the one that aggressed on Tara in that particular instance. However, Tara, the white um, dog that you're gonna see doing this procedure, had um, a history of, of resource guarding in the sense of she would run up to the barrier when Jin had something. So some growling and some, um, lun I don't know if lunging, but you know, sort of running up and rah, 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 um, whenever Jin had something. So that's what we were doing the voluntary sharing for <laughs> was trying to eliminate that response from Tara because we weren't sure if that was what caused the aggression from Jen. So we were not sure if Tara went, oh, you have something that I want. And then Jen responded. Um, and so just to be sure that that was not part of the equation as we moved forward with integrating them, um, we wanted to eliminate that particular behavior um, or particular response from Tara. So you are gonna see um, all of the different steps that we went through to get to the point of doing the voluntary sharing with Jen and Tara. Uh, yeah, maybe I should have. Oh, she came right back. Yes, good girl. Sorry, I'm gonna pause right there because I do wanna clarify one thing. 
Um, we didn't want to take the time to train a chin rest or anything like that, especially because Tara, as I said, is um, extremely fearful um, and is hand shy. Not that we couldn't have used um, something for her to put her chin on that did not involve a body part, but it was just easier for us to use stationing. So Tara had never, um, she did not know mat behavior, hadn't learned any stationing. So we essentially brought out this rug that she is sitting on and built in some when you're, you know, if you go and sit on the rug, you get treats. So then she began offering that behavior. And then we turned that stationing behavior into her start button. So you will notice that she is feeding away from the carpet so that Tara has to get up and off the carpet. And Tara's start button is going back and sitting on the carpet. So I just wanted to make that quick clarification because it, it's going to look a little bit different than some of the other ones you've seen so far. Yes, if she does that one more time, we'll start having you put a treat in the bowl first and then feed her. There she goes. Yes, good job. So would you want the bowl on the carpet? No, because we want it up where she can't access it. So if it's just there on the couch, that's okay, fine. Okay, okay. Yep. So now in the bowl? Yep, so now you put a treat yeah. in the bowl and then you put her treat down on the ground. Perfect. Good bowl. Just like that. Okay. And I think the only thing that's changed is the stuffed animal. So that's probably what's causing. So we'll see if she can overcome it. We'll give her, um, go ahead and actually set a treat down where you were. So put a treat on the ground where we were doing it. Okay. And we'll see if that can sort of start it. If she's comfortable enough to come over there to eat it and then we'll wait for her to offer her stationing to continue and if she doesn't then that's data that the stuffed animal is just one bridge too far yes. oh beautiful <laughs> yes. It's at least a, a mutually respectful dance. <laughs> Where they're figuring each other out, but they haven't they haven't quite come to terms just yet. Oh, that's so great. Oh, that's so beautiful. So, so that last little clip, we were not doing a voluntary sharing. Um, we were having them in the same space together um, and there was no food involved. So um, the client was very nervous about having them together after that initial incident. And this, this was several months after that um, initial incident had occurred, but um, it was, it was hard for her not to get worked up and tense and anticipate, you know, worrying about what might happen. 
Um, so we were just working through having a couple extra people there um, and sort of talking her through how they were communicating. And so there was some good communication. You'll notice that Tara laid down with her um, facing away from Jen. So there wasn't any um, you know, direct stare, very um, decompression type thing. It is confusing to me. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. So you'll notice that Jen um, was like, hey, I noticed that she goes over and sits here and that causes you to put a treat down. <laughs> Um, so yes, Jen was trying to mimic that behavior and um, trying to get the treat. So sometimes, yes, it can be confusing for the other animal. Um, a lot of times they're totally fine with it because they're just getting treats for not doing anything. Um, but yes, Jen was trying to jumpstart that. <laughs> well, if I sit over here, just like she is, can I get a treat that way? Um, so yes, that. That was indeed happening. And that, that was the very first time that they had done that procedure. Um, I think as we went along, she sort of understood it a little bit better. Okay. All right, we're gonna have plenty of time for q and I'm excited. Okay, so the key takeaways are one, that cooperative care and counter conditioning puts the animal in charge. So that's the number one thing to take away. Um, that start buttons can be trained or organic, so just sort of develop, and they can be one and done or duration. Um, the protocols are flexible so that you can adjust to suit the animal and the situation. So you've seen a couple different applications, a couple different um, ways that they were applied depending on the um, situation. And um, number four, I didn't get a chance to really um, highlight a whole lot, but it's really, really important when you are doing this. If you are doing it cooperatively, then it's important that that animal really does have choice and that you are honoring the contract. And um, the animal should be able to, to predict exactly what's going to happen. Um, so there aren't any curveballs thrown in there like, wait, I thought when I did this, that this particular thing was going to happen. And now you're doing this other thing. And whoa, I wasn't quite on board with that. Um, so we, we don't want to ruin what we've established by changing things up. So honor that contract and then also listen for the little no's. Because like I said, if we're getting a giant no, then there were definitely some little no's going on that we maybe weren't aware of. Um, I wish I had put in a couple more videos that maybe showed some dogs saying no. Um, I just, it just so happened that the most recent one with Hopper, she didn't say no, didn't feel like saying no at all. Um, but um, a lot of times in some of our training sessions, Hopper will um, go to the side of the box instead of doing her chin rest on the box. And so we'll just reset, toss some treats, see if she decides that she wants to come back and do the chin rest or not. Um, but like I said, I love when they say no, um, because I feel like they're, they're sort of maintaining that that trust like i can still do this right okay yeah okay now let's let's keep doing it um but obviously if i if we were getting several no's so maybe a couple in a row and then we did one yes and then we started saying no again we're definitely going to pay attention to that trend if we're starting to get more no's then we definitely need to change things up um, if they're maybe not as committed. So um, you could see in the voluntary sharing video with Han that he was just throwing his chin down there um, with commitment. If we started to get like tentative where he's just sort of hovering, we're going to start to pay attention to that. All right. Um, last slide is, of course, the um, additional resources. So that is my email address there. Um, my Facebook, I will be honest and say that I am not very good about posting on my um, uh, work page. <laughs> I keep meaning to get better about that. But um, if you do want to go on there and you are welcome to ask um, questions or post on there, the Friends of Control Unleashed Facebook group is fabulous. I highly recommend um, that you join that. So a lot of the um, certified instructors are in there in addition to Leslie. And you are welcome to ask questions about um, specific issues that you're having or just general questions. Um, and we all um, jump in there and try to um, 
help when there are questions and you're also just welcome to share successes. We love those too. Uh, I did put in YouTube pages. So my YouTube page, Leslie's YouTube page. So you can see um, some of the videos I shared are on there. And then the start buttons and more if you wanted to um, deep dive into start buttons and all their various, um, yeah, different things that you can do with them. Okay, what questions do you have for me? Leslie, I'm thinking that since there isn't a lot of chatter and you've done some questions already, uh -huh. maybe you could go up to the top. Yep. And if you didn't answer it yet, um, I will do that. answer it now instead of my feeding you the questions. Also, everyone, um, you're going to get the video of this webinar, but you're also going to get the slides. So you don't really have to scribble down all these resources. You'll have them and you can you know, look at them then. Okay. All right, Angie. All right. Um, I did see one comment and this was back way at the beginning um, where it was the doing start buttons with Piper for brushing. And somebody commented that it just looks like the dog is waiting for the treat. Um, I'm not sure if there's a question in there <laughs> or if you wanted to. So if you, if you did have a specific question, um, type that in there for me. Um, all right, please explain the food treats on the finished behavior. When are you giving them and why? And are you doing any verbal cues? What do you mean by an end needed for the duration cue? Okay, so this is also that same video. So what I mean by an end for the duration cue is you should be marking. So if the dog is doing a duration behavior such as a chin rest and they have not picked their chin up to say, to ask you to stop. And so you are done with that rep you are going to release them from that behavior. Um, so that's what I mean by um, the ending of it. So I would typically say a yes, or it would be a click, um, which releases them from that and lets them know that a treat is going to be coming. Again, the treat is fed away from it so that they have the option of doing the behavior again. So in that instance, she was putting her, she was doing the chin rest on my leg. I would do a brush, I would release her, um, say, I, so in, in the first one, I wasn't doing a marker because I had started with a one and done. And so I just hadn't made that transition in my head. I was just feeding. Um, but basically I would release her by saying yes, and then put the treat away and then she would do it again. And we would do some more brushing. Um, what I meant by finished behavior was basically, um, like in a couple of them, I, I mentioned the finished behavior. It was just going from introducing this concept of you do the chin rest and it means I'm going to do something with the brush to full several strokes of the brush, each repetition, and then releasing her. So it was just sort of the end result of having worked through this. Um, I think I hit all of those. And I, am I doing any verbal cues? I am not doing verbal cues because with cooperative, it's up to Piper. So I am not asking her to do anything. It's all context cues. So typically the context cues for me brushing are, I'm gonna sit down on the ground. So that gives her access to my legs where she can do her chin rest. And I'm gonna have the brush. It's either in my hand or it's next to me so that she can see it. Typically I have it in my hand. Um, and so that says to her, I, I have the brush here. If you want me to brush you, we can do that right now. So if she offers the chin rest, I'm going to brush a couple strokes and then I'm going to say yes. And I'm going to feed a treat away. And if she comes back and gives the chin rest again, then I'm going to brush again. Um, and if I were doing nail trims, we would be most likely in a, there is a specific location that I did nail trims with her. So we would go to that specific location. I would have the nail clippers available. And again, I would just be in a position with the tool that I'm going to be using that says, if you want to do this, this opportunity is now available. And if she wants to do it, then, then she'll do her start button and I will do my procedure and I'll release her and feed and then we'll see if she does it again. So that's sort of how that works. All right, so do you just wait for the dog to naturally offer the lower head? I think I touched on that by saying if you're, it's 
with an organically grown start button, it can be anything. Um, and it depends on what you're wanting to do, what that behavior might look like. Um, so one of the examples there was um, ever doing the lowering of the head. Um, there was one video that I wanted to throw in and I realized today that I didn't and I'm really mad at myself. There is a video with um, ever, so the dog in the voluntary sharing with the cat and Leslie's other dog, Sage, who at the time was um, relatively young pup, well, relatively young dog, still sort of puppyish. And ever had um, two different start buttons. So the lowering of the head was what she would do to say feed Sage. So very similar to with the cat. So ever would lower her head, Leslie would feed Sage a treat and then ever a treat. Ever would lower her head, Leslie would feed Sage a treat and then ever a treat. So the lowering of the head meant that the other dog was going to get fed and the other dog getting fed meant that ever was going to get fed. And then there was a climb station out and um, Leslie moved over to that to see it and said to ever, should I tug with Sage? So the start, be start button behavior there was if Sage, excuse me, if ever went and sat on the climb. So if she went to her station, that would tell Leslie to play tug with Sage. So this is shifting over to that that other reason you would do voluntary sharing, taking turns, the dog saying you can interact um, with this other animal. So Ever would go to the station and sit. Leslie would tug with Sage, then she would stop. She would feed Ever off of the climb. So that got her off of the station. And then she would wait and see, did Ever go back to the station to say tug with Sage again? So those were two different start button behaviors that had two different results um, and different context cues. So having treats versus having the tug, being next to the climb. Um, so all of those things are different ways that um, it was the dog could tell what was being offered or what the options were. Um, and they had the choice of whether or not to do those. I know it would have been so much better had you seen the video than me explaining it, but hopefully that got the point across. Okay. Oh, so oh, the other thing I was going to say is um, another organic start button. So there is another video <laughs> where Ever has a tendency to lean into Leslie. So leaning against her leg became the start button for Leslie to move forward one step. So they were doing a requested approach training um, when her son was in a costume, um, scary costume. <laughs> so Ever would lean into Leslie. Leslie would take one step forward. She would feed Ever so that Ever moved away from her. And if Ever leaned into her again, that was a start button that told her to go forward. So that was organically grown start button in the sense that it's a behavior that Ever naturally started to do. And so Leslie turned that behavior that was being offered into a start button. And that's what we mean by organically grown. So something that the dog is doing that lends itself into the procedure that you want to perform can become a start button. Okay, maybe saying no without a treat is like a punishment. Um, you could, you know, you could look at it that way in terms of, you know, how badly does the dog want the food? <laughs> but I think of the dog, you know, I, I have, I tend to have labs, so they always think they're starving. Um, but I, I do, like I said, I do tend to use the lower value treats. So hopefully they're not, you know, dying for it, but um, it's still, no matter what I have, my voice starts salivating like crazy. Um, what I would say is I, there can be a subtle pressure. So if the dog is only getting something when they say yes, and they're not getting anything when they say no, there is definitely a subtle pressure to say yes. And that's what we want to avoid setting up. So it doesn't mean that you have to pay the no every time, but I would say if you're not paying the no, then it's because you are making some other adjustment. So, oh, this, this isn't working for you. You're saying, no, you don't wanna do it. Let me see if I can change things up. Are you more comfortable? Do you want to say yes? Or I'm going to acknowledge the no, like, oh, okay, so I'm gonna feed you out of place. I understand you you didn't wanna say yes. I'm gonna see once you've said no, are you willing to say yes again? And more often than not, that's what happens. The dog says no, and then they go right back to saying yes. If the dog says no again, I might pay it again. And then if I get a third no, that I'm like, okay, something's wrong. I need to change something here. Or you're just done. Maybe we've been doing this too long and you're done. 
Um, but I'm oh, it's always a question. It's always data gathering. I like to say that there are no wrong answers in Control Unleashed. Um, everything is just data because you're always asking questions. Are you comfortable with this? Do you want to do this right now? Now, no, you do not. Okay. Is there something I need to change, or did you just need a short break and now you're okay? All right. Da, da, da. My problem is getting the dog to come see me. I talked about that starting before you even bring in the thing that they have a negative association with. Um, that actually reminds me something that I did not touch on in the presentation and I should have. And some of these, especially when we're doing cooperative care, there are going to be times where you are trying to work on doing something cooperatively that has been aversive to your for your dog so it's something that they do not like currently that they are either afraid of or they find um you know there are a lot of dogs out there that they do not like nail trims <laughs> some dogs don't like brushing some dogs don't like taking a bath whatever that is there is a current negative association it is going to take time to work through that and turn it into something that your dog is comfortable with I'm not necessarily going to say it's positive association. It depends on how badly they feel about it. Hopefully it gets to a point where it's positive. Yay. Um, but at least that they get comfortable that they're willing to say yes. That can take some time. Um, and there you may need to do that procedure before they get to the point where they're willingly saying yes. And so what I mean by that is let's say that you have a dog that does not like nail trims and it takes you six months to get to the point where you can trim their nails. Um, a fellow certified instructor took 18 months for her dog to finally be comfortable, fully comfortable with dremeling. That dog's nails had to be taken care of in that 18 months. The key there is to have two very distinct setups. This one is where things have to happen and you are not asking your dog. This is not an option. This is our, this is going to happen. Again, we are very clear. So in that scenario, it meant that the dog was muzzled, the dog was tethered, and it, it was, you know, done in this location. And the dog knew that it just meant I got to get through, you know, I got to get through this. They're not asking me. And that was a very separate context and did not involve this cooperative setting. Because the last thing we want to do is go set up this idea of you have control. And then the next time we do this, we've taken away that control. So those are two different things. And the way to do that successfully is to make it look different to the dog. As many things as you can make clear that are different, you can have it in a different room. You're going to have um, a different setup. So with um, Rocket, with the harness, there are two different harnesses. When they need to put the harness on and just go, it is a separate harness than the one they're doing cooperatively. Um, so, you know, just think about those things. I had some people that were doing um, car, working through car anxiety and they used a different door when they were doing the you have to get in the car and we have to go versus we're going to do a cooperative session. So they were using a different door when they were doing the you have to go. There was no talking about it. It was just simply the equipment was on. They helped the dog into the car um, and, you know, they. I, I don't know, they may have offered treats after the dog was in the car, but I don't know that they even did that. But you definitely want to avoid, avoid the bribing. The, oh, come on, come on, let's just go, let's just get this over with. And I'm gonna, you know, trail treats over there. Um, that's what was really interesting with one of them. It wasn't so much that we got to the cooperative aspect of it, but it was that they stopped doing that. And it was just the no nonsense had to get it done. And that's actually made it, it sort of flipped a switch. It was like what had been a 15 to 20 minute procedure was like a one minute procedure and it was easier for them and less stressful for them and less stressful for the dog because it was, it was just clear and it was done. Um, and that worked. <laughs> so I did, I just wanted to be sure that I covered that. So um, that's how you would go about working on something cooperatively that does need to be done in the meantime. All right. I'm going to actually shoot down to the bottom just to see if anybody had questions about that. Um, specific thing that I just said about making things look different. I love that I have current students chiming in. <laughs> okay. All right, so I don't see any questions about that specifically. So let me keep going. 
Da, da, da. I would be hiding under the sofa until I left the room. <laughs> okay, then we need we need to establish some other foundations first. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, a, a lot of it is that sort of building in this idea of conversational training and choice. So even before we get to this cooperative um, care and counter conditioning, the control unleashed program is all about building in that that conversation those questions that choice so we've already established that foundation before we even get to this point um so if so that's probably what i would say would be your go-to before even starting on this cooperative stuff start with control and leash foundations um and and sort of build that that language that repertoire that you can then work off of to move on to these things. And that's why I do have it set up that way. So you start with control and leash foundations, and then we add in the pattern games. And then the last thing that we do is the cooperative stuff um, because you've already built that relationship with your dog and they've already become familiar with this idea of having choice and some control and say in things. And so it flows very naturally into um, giving them even more of those options um, in a structured way that looks familiar to them. All right. I knew a lot of, yeah, so I touched on this, but yes, Kate, so having a specific place um, to do cooperative care. And so I actually do have that. I have a specific location that we go if I was doing toothbrushing with Piper, which is separate from where we were doing nail trims, which is separate from where we were doing brushing. And so in addition to having the implements out so she could see the toothbrush and the toothpaste versus she could see the clippers and the Dremel versus she could see the brush and the comb. Um, so those things helped in addition to where we were, helped to establish what it was that um, I was asking if she wanted to do. So she knew exactly what that start button would entail because every single one of those was a chin rest behavior, but it, it was chin resting in different locations and on different stations. So for the brushing, she was on my leg. For the tooth brushing, it was a um, up, upside down bucket that she would rest her chin on. Um, and then for the tooth brushing, she was rest, resting her chin on the stair. So different stations for the chin rest in addition to different locations. Okay. Have you ever seen it successful when the person has an object that signals cooperative care instead so that the dog doesn't have to move? Yes. Um, so with Obi, I do not have a designated, actually, I, I will say I don't have a designated spot, but because he loves to get up on my bed more often than not, we do most of our cooperative stuff on my bed. So it's not location specific, but the, the implement that I have basically signals what it is that we're doing. So when we were doing the eardrops, the eardrops were visible, the Q-tips were visible. When we're doing nail trim, same thing, nail, uh, the clippers and the Dremel is visible. In addition, if especially if they um, are doing the chin rest, you can have dif the, the different stations that the dog is chin resting on also indicate. So it doesn't have to be a physical station. And like I said, the step, it could be something portable like the upside down bucket. Um, a lot of people in my classes, you um, saw in the video where um, Rocket, there was something on the person's arm. That is the station that says we're doing this. So it could be different things that the dog is resting their chin on that has very clear context cues of what is happening. Um, so yes, there are different variations of that. How do you get the dog to rest their head? All right, so I touched on chin rest. Why the clicker cue? So it's not a cue, it's a release. So typically when you are using a clicker, the clicker means that your dog has done something that has earned a treat. So it tends to be a release cue. So, well, I, then I use the word cue, but it, it basically is a release versus a asking to do something type of cue. So in the scenario with Rocket, the clicker was the ending the behavior of the chin rest and saying, we're done with that rep, here is your treat. And then waiting to see, did he start the procedure again? Did he offer the chin rest again? So where they were using a clicker, I was typically saying yes. Or when I was doing the one, two, three count, the three was the, the release that said, now it's time for the treat. Are there any start button behaviors with duration where the dog would still have the ability to move their head around? Yes. Um, so 
Obi's head sort of moved when he was on his side. So like when he's laying down, he is not resting his head on the side. His head can, sometimes it's further down, sometimes it's further up. Um, so the duration behavior tends to be a targeting behavior and targeting behaviors can be different body parts. So um, I didn't show you the video of doing rat with him, but his uh, start button behavior was actually his paw. So this was another one that I did in one session where I was experimenting. Um, as I'm talking, I'm going to see if I can pull that up and share that with you. Um, so I used, at that time, he didn't have the laying down on his side, although I don't know that that would work anyway. But he would, um, as I said, offer his paw to make things happen. And so I sat down on the ground and sat in front of him and he immediately offered his paw because he wanted the treats that he knew that I had. So um, he gave me his paw, I gave him a treat. He gave me his paw, I gave him a treat. I did that a couple times. And then I turned it into a start button by making something happen after he gave me his paw. So in this case, what that meant was that my husband, um, who I enlisted to be my helper, <laughs> um, would walk would walk toward a, would come forward. So um, we were in the family area and my husband was in the kitchen. Obi would give me his paw. He would walk forward and stop. And then I would mark, feed Obi out of place and see if he offered his paw again. So he started to learn that offering his paw meant that my husband was going to move. And then I eventually had um, incorporated a broom into that scenario because Obi does not like the broom. So that's um, what I was doing with Crestor Pro Training. And I have it right here. So I'm going to leave it up here, make sure that I get to all the questions. If we have time, I'll pull that up. Um, but it could be a, so the short answer is it could be a paw station. It could be that they put their paw on something and hold it there. It could be a physical station like what we did with um, Tara. So she was just sitting at a physical station. So her head was free to move about. So yes, you definitely can have a duration start button that does not involve a chin rest or a head placement. Okay. Um, I gotta go back up to where I was. Okay, uh, by the dog resting their head, is he giving permission to the vacuum? Yes. So that was a chin rest behavior on the station of the box. And the, in that case, it was a pink towel. So the pink towel on top of the box signaled that we were going to be doing requested approach training with the vacuum. And whenever Hopper would put her chin on the box, that was her saying, yes, you may move the vacuum or move the wand. Okay, what does rat look like outside of a training session once the behavior is fully learned, for example, when actively vacuuming? Um, so once, if you are not in a training session, then the dog does not have control over it. <laughs> so it's more a question of either getting to the point where she doesn't feel like she needs to control it, so she is comfortable with its movement, and at that point, then we could freely vacuum, or we might be transitioning into, you know, as we go forward with this process and we get to the point where we're turning the vacuum on and she has control over that and its movement, we could get to a point where she says, yes, you can vacuum, um, you know, and maybe we vac we have it on and we vacuum for five seconds and then we stop and see, does she tell us to vacuum again? So there are gonna be a lot of steps between where we are now and where it's at the point that it's gonna be, she could vacuum an entire room. Um, and how quickly we go through those steps just depends on Hopper. But again, the more that we splice and make it easy for her to be successful, the faster we're going to get to that point. Um, so at this point, now that we're moving it, we can very quickly shift to adding some duration and adding some length into what we're move movement wise. Um, and then we need to separately add in the audio of having the vacuum on and then put those things together. But basically at the point where she is vacuuming an entire room and Hopper is okay with it, then we would not be doing requested approach training. We would have successfully counter conditioned her feelings to the vacuum. And that's really our end goal. It's not to say that she can forever control this movement, 
but by having control over that thing that she feels more comfortable with it. Um, she is a herding dog. She may at some point feel the need to control the movement, but I'm sure that at that point, Rebecca could do a couple rat sessions with her. And then she, you know, I, I, I suspect that it would be very easy to maintain at that point. Um, okay. Is the dog in the pen? Yeah. So I answered that one. Would you ever use a calming cap as a visual barrier? That is an excellent question. Again, it's always going to be, it depends on what you're doing and what your end result is. So the, so could you? Yes. Um, it would depend on what you were working on, whether or not I would recommend that, um, as the visual barrier. So the cat and the dog, like the same treats. Yes. <laughs> I'm not sure what Leslie was feeding. Um, and that one, it did look at, like it was actually treats. A lot of times what I see her in the videos, it looks like it's like more like cheese, lunch meaty type stuff, which, you know, or slices of meat, whatever. Um, but in that one, it, it, yeah. So obviously it's something that they could both have. Yes. Sometimes it is confusing to the other animal. We talked about that. You were very welcome. All right. In the case where you are helping to reduce reactivity in the house, does the reactive dog become cured at some point, or does the protocol have to be repeated periodically, e.g. daily to achieve? Yeah. So it's that same, that same answer about, uh, counter conditioning, it depends on how far you are in the counter conditioning process. It depends on how far you have to go in terms of where you are starting, how long it's going to take you to get to that point, and whether what cured looks like for one dog is going to be very different than cured for another. So having reasonable expectations, depending on breed and, you know, all of those different legs. So the learning history and the environment the dog is in and their genetics and all of those things. Um, you know, we can't answer questions about specifics without having those specific details. But um, in terms of overall, the idea is essentially to help the dog either feel better about something or to develop successful coping strategies that allow them to deal with stressful things in their environment. Um, in terms of specifically rat and voluntary sharing, our goal with voluntary sharing is to help them um, feel better about other animals accessing things. And so hopefully there is less of a desire to resource guard. You know, again, it depends on how much of resource guard or how many different things they're doing. If it's, if it's very specific context, it's going to be a lot easier to successfully work through that versus a generalized garter. Um, in terms of requested approach training, again, you know, we're going to start with specific things. So if the dog is uncomfortable with one specific thing, we're going to work through that. And then once we do that, if they're still, you know, it depends on how many different things they are and how many times we would have to go through it for it to generalize. But if you think about something like a dog that tends to be reactive around strangers, if we incorporate this idea of them having some choice and control, then they are more likely to be comfortable in a scenario where they are meeting somebody new because we've established those protocols. And it may not always be that they're going to be saying that person can move, but we have established a very clear procedure of what happens when somebody new comes over and the dog knows what their um, choices are. You know, preferably that's going to be a station behavior where they can go and be in a safe bubble where they know that that person cannot interact with them. If they do need some help, they have a couple things that they can do. They can, you know, play some look at that with you or they can um, ask for some help. You know, so again, it's all about that communication piece. But the more we have that predictability and that trust in the system, the, the more we're going to have those positive results. Um Okay. Augie is very suspicious of new things in training generally, even if it's not actually scary. We've had a really hard time with cooperative care because he gets suspicious of the setup. Um, I'm having that problem with my bearded dragon right now because we're having issues with eating. <laughs> is there a way to set up a start button for the whole session at the very beginning of starting off? Um, I'm not, Kate, can you be more specific of what you mean by, um, setting up a start button? So are you referring to like where I started off having the start button mean just touching and then eventually I'm, I went to brushing or do you, are you meaning like 
not having to go through and train a train the start button itself. So, our, so I guess that's my question. Are we talking about the training of the start button or changing the meaning of the start button? Um, because if it's the latter, the changing of the meaning of the start button, definitely. So that was something that we did with Hopper. Every time we do a session, it is the exact same thing that happens with the vacuum. The vacuum is moving in one direction for a specific length each time. So we're not starting off that the vacuum moves a little bit. And then by the end of the session, the vacuum is moving a lot. Each individual session, the exact same thing happens. And then once she's comfortable with that, then we will go to another session where maybe we're moving it instead of two inches, we're moving it four inches or something like that. But within the session, it's exactly the same. Um, if you're talking about training the start button, we would probably need to get more into specifics because I'm not sure what you mean by that. So uh, feel free to clarify that for me, the multiple stuff. Oh, I didn't realize that was public access. Thank you, Stevie. So she put a link to the um, Ever uh, Climb video. I did not realize that was on YouTube because I have constantly wanted that one to be out there in the public. Okay. Could the organic start button wind up being poisoned? Like with the dog leaning into Leslie, the dog does that because something is rewarding or soothing about the contact, but then the leaning takes on a different meaning as a start button. Um, the short answer, could it? Yes. The longer answer is if we are doing it correctly, then it should not be poisoned because again, we're listening to those little no's. Um, I believe that prior to this particular scenario, the leaning in was already turned into a start button that a lean means one step forward. It was just in this specific session. They just happened to be moving towards the fly. And again, ever understood that she had control. Um, and so if ever leaned in and they took a step forward and she released her from that, if ever did not want to move forward again, she was not going to come back in and, and do the lean in. And in fact, once they get to a certain point, then ever does stop saying yes. And then they just, you know, end the session there. Um, so there, there is something to, you don't want to immediately jump in like, oh, you've been doing this and it's a rewardable behavior. And now you do this and I trim a nail. Um, so it's, it's about, again, getting comfortable with sort of, this means that something is going to happen, but it's something that you're comfortable with. Um, at least we think we're 90% sure you're going to be comfortable with it. And if we were just slightly off, then we're going to adjust it so that you're, you know, if you were not quite sure, then we're going to make it easier. But um, it's, oh yeah, it's always something to keep in mind. Um, with this stuff is that we are paying great attention to the animal's comfort level and their communication. And are there any little no's or any little hesitations? We're paying a lot of attention to that so that we, we do not push them into saying yes when they don't really mean yes. Okay, black and white Corgi <laughs> is usually more enthusiastic when she comes back after she tests with a no because she knows she has control. Yeah, see, I, I really think Hopper enjoys um, testing the system. <laughs> and, and I think Rocket does too. Although, although with Rocket, I do think sometimes there is that processing. But with Hopper, it's definitely like, well, what if I do this? <laughs> All right. You are very welcome, Eve. Uh, okay, sweet. You can read my Angie's control those classes. Thank you for making sense. All right. Like just to tell him that we are going to do something a bit formal and it's going to be safe, keeping it predictable. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, predictable is key. So you want it to be predictable. And also building off of what he knows. So if there's something that he knows and trusts, a system that's in place that's familiar, can you build on that? So what we would want to avoid is taking a system that he knows and is familiar and then adding in something that he is not going to like. But um, let me see if I can think of an example. So um, if there is some sort of training that you do, so like if you have a routine that's built in where you guys are interacting or you're training or you're doing something, can you add one aspect in like, um, like something fun. So choice games are fun. So if you're playing a game and you have two different toys, 
you know, which one do you want to play with? And he knows is one of them. And then you start playing with that, you know, so start to build in this idea of making choices and offering behaviors, because a lot of times I think there are dogs that don't understand that aspect. They're either constantly waiting to be told what to do next, or um, especially with fearful dogs, you aren't seeing a whole lot of offered behavior because a lot of behavior has been suppressed from, um, you know, that, that fear you're just, you're sort of in the lower end of, um, that pyramid <laughs> of what you pay attention to, um, and that, that safety pyramid. Um, so yeah, think about that. And we can talk specifics in class, Kate, but yeah, that's, that's what I would start with is how can you start with something that's familiar to him within a training context or an interaction context and build from there? Would you use voluntary sharing protocol for a dog that barks or gets between two people cuddling? Uh, yes, you could. You, you, you basically could use either of those two because your start button would be saying for those two people to interact. So, you know, you could think of it from the movement aspect of the dog is controlling their movement by telling them what to do. Um, or you could think about it in terms of voluntary sharing because those people are paying attention to each other and not the dog. But because the dog is barking and getting in between, that to me says it's more about control than it is about jealousy, um, which I think tends to happen a lot of times with people doing that. You tend to get those, you know, herding dogs or, or those dogs that are the, you know, the police who other dogs are having too much fun and they feel like they need to control that. Um, that's what it sounds like just from that little tiny bit of information that I have, but essentially you are using a start button that gives them control over that. And, and hopefully in the long run by having control over that and them telling you to, you know, interact with each other, give each other a hug or something like that. Um, but hopefully the dog starts to feel better about it. But again, you wouldn't start with the dog doing something and then you do this nice big giant hug because we're setting the dog up for failure. So it would be a process of, first of all, establishing an offered behavior that you would want to be the start button and then the start button makes something happen. And then eventually we start to, you know, so it might be the two people approach each other and then move away to reset. And then eventually they're just touching, you know, so anyway, so we would add intensity as we go along, but yeah, set in separate sessions. So yeah, so, so for the specifics, obviously we would want to work through it, but um, join the class. <laughs> All right, formal or new? Okay, and I'm guessing the answer is just that time does move him towards choosing optimism more often. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and unfortunately, and this is, this is what happened with my bearded dragon was my bearded dragon stopped eating greens and when they're young, they're supposed to be doing like 90% bugs. And then when they're adult, it slips to 90% greens. And so I was trying to get greens in by sticking greens in the mouth as we were chewing on bugs. And I know better. And now he doesn't trust any. So you hold something out and he's like, uh-uh. <laughs> Yes, I know better. And yet I was so worried about losing weight that, yeah. And so, yes, <laughs> I have poisoned the eating. Um, you were very welcome, TJ. Is there scientific research on any of these methods? I imagine dogs with more autonomy like this are measurably happier. That is a great question. Um, not about these methods specifically, um, but I would not be surprised if there is some research about choice and dogs. Um, I do not know the answer to that question, but, um, I would not be surprised if there is some sort of research ongoing because there is a lot of research ongoing now into, um, you know, di different aspects of, of behavior, um, in dogs and, and neurological stuff. So yeah, great question. Can you train a well-adjusted animal to read a yes, no response by a non-social? Ah, <laughs> so what, when you, when you meet, so I'm guessing that we're talking about like, 
interaction between them and one dog not reading because the other dog is maybe stiff or fearful that the well socialized dog is misreading what's going on with the under socialized dog because the under socialized dog and I'm just using that term I know that's not necessarily right um to distinguish but that dog does not know how to send the appropriate signals is that am I understanding that correctly first off <laughs> Susan <laughs> And if so, what is it that reverse the anxious? Okay, so the anxious dog does not know how to read the signals that the well socialized dog is sending, you know, which is pretty typical. Um, I would need more. So if you're okay, <laughs> so see that this one's really complex. I don't know that you could teach them specifically like what that dog is signaling but what i would say is adding structure can help the anxious dog feel more comfortable so almost like in the scenario where the one dog was in the x pen and they were controlling the movement of the other if the anxious dog could control the movement of the well socialized dog so like if you had the anxious dog definitely work on mat work and stationing so that that anxious dog has their safety bubble um, if they love their crate, their crate could be their safety bubble um, so that they have their spot that they can be in. And from that spot, they could use a start button to control the movement of the well socialized dog. So in the same way that he was moving that dog around, it wouldn't even necessarily have to be an approach. It could be a parallel, but it's just that movement. So like the anxious dog can say, yeah, that dog can move. So they can, you know, move over here. And then, you know, and again, if you either have a helper that can be feeding that dog, um, or your helper is the one moving the well socialized dog, and you're working with the anxious dog, but adding in that predictable procedure and that control might help that anxious dog to feel more comfortable around the well socialized dog. And I, I would just say more structure in general. So even though the well socialized dog is sending the appropriate signals, the anxious dog isn't feeling good about that. So giving them lots of space and um, when you are not there to have things structured and when they do interact, that you are um, providing a lot of structure to that interaction. And so helping that anxious dog feel safer in general, they are going to be more willing to um, assume good intentions. <laughs> the other dog they're going to feel safer and so they might be more willing to um assess what is going on from the other dog than immediately assuming that you know oh this is this is scary that that dog is doing that um so hopefully that was somewhat helpful and somewhat coherent could rat be used for dogs that are overexcited oh, of course yes yes um there are a lot of strategies in Control Unleash to help a dog that is overexcited by other dogs. Um, could you utilize rat? Yes. I am not sure that that would be my go-to for helping over arousal. Um, I'm thinking that pattern games would probably be my go-to in general for a dog that gets overexcited about other dogs. Um, so that but but I would still want the other dog to be a helper dog in the sense that you were controlling that other dog's movement. So we're not just out and about with dogs moving around willy nilly um, so that you could control to again to set up for success. So you're doing a pattern game or look at that one or the other. Um, and that dog is starting off maybe still and sitting. And then that dog, as he gets more comfortable or, or less excited about that other dog, then that other dog can start to slowly move. And so we can just start to shape, um, more intensity as that dog has had some success. So it's, it's always going to start with what do we need to do to find that success? Oh, shoot. We ran out of time and I didn't get to do my Obi-Wan video, but it, it is on my, um, YouTube page. So, um, if you are curious about that, it is a public, um, I believe it's on my YouTube page. It's a public video. So you can check that out. And I want to thank you a lot, as does everyone else in chat, it looks like. Um, and everyone else, thank you for joining us. All right. Bye, all. Thank you.